Welcome back, sleepyheads, to another episode of Sleepy Aliens Perspective. I am your host, H. Lee. Thank you for tuning in. Tonight, I'm going to be following up with our discussion about following through with escalated conflict and being afraid of hurting someone else, being afraid of your own emotions, of violence, and just the general consequences of conflict. So yeah, we're going to be discussing all of that, and I have a really great example because it seems the universe responded to my curiosity immediately. And yesterday was my Friday at work, and you know what? When I got up that day, I actually got a good amount of sleep, so I was feeling okay, and I didn't need to be overly caffeinated. And it was a rainy day, and I walked into work, and... You know, everybody seemed to be in a good mood. I had a good conversation with my boss. I was like, this is a good energy. And then I was also put on a pretty good register. You know, one that's not too busy, but, you know, it's it's pretty chill if it's your Friday at work. But yeah, so everything was starting off good. I think I also had a smoothie with me too. I made a smoothie. But yeah, I think within the first hour of my shift my female co-worker who sexually harassed me approached me at my register with my supervisor and this female co-worker isn't even in the same department as me Um, she works in the produce department but she approaches me with my supervisor to watch us as she confronts me about why I no longer want to acknowledge her or look at her. Naturally, I was pretty stunned. I was really confused. (laughs) The audacity, but I'm really good at seeing when the universe is giving me an opportunity to have a moment to step into a greater level of strength like I've had some crazy shit happen to me throughout my life and one thing I've learned is just to ride out the wave and embrace the challenge and focus on what you'll learn and how you'll grow from that challenge that just always has gotten me through and I think that's just why I'm like such a goal oriented kind of obsessive person but And I know people are like, you can't be all about, you know, goals and stuff. And, you know, humans are all susceptible to addictions, you know. Hey, capitalism, right? So it shouldn't be shocking that someone might be a little addicted to goals, you know. And I think that's a healthy addiction. But anyways, there I am, rambling again. But yeah, so we're going to be talking about the escalated conflict and the situation with my coworker. And I want you to know that I'm like so grateful that it happened. And it's not like I was afraid to report her or anything like that. It says that in my previous job, I dealt with a lot of sexual harassment that I had to report. And I think it was just being aware that I was in this environment that was just so sexually charged but in a really inappropriate and negative way and I'm in that setting where the social stakes were higher where I was on track in like this corporate academia world to keep climbing up some pretty accessible ladders and I was doing really well like outstanding employee award kind of well so but I had to report these people and regardless if you report or not it just changes of your environment and it'll never be the same after that and you break the status quo with some people and then you're also reminded that older women that you may work with, the response is not as like riled up as you would expect. I don't know. It's it's just realizing that there's a lot of limitations and following 
in that process, in the aftermath of that process. And you realize some unfortunate things and realities that, and I, I have no ill feelings about it at all. The whole situation helped me find my voice, exercise my voice and stand up for myself and accept that I was going to be uncomfortable and I just breach into new boundaries. It was, it was just a very enlightening experience and I'm grateful for it. But I also, the sad realization is that the older women that I worked with, at first I was kind of angry with them, but then I realized that to get as far as they've had is where they are in their careers. And a lot of these women I, I like looked up, I look up to them still, I do. I have a lot of respect for them because yeah, to get as far as they are, I can't imagine what they've had to deal with. The stuff they've heard about or, I, you know, it's just, yeah, it's a never ending story. And I say all that because when I got this job at New Seasons, I was determined to not have any problems like that. I was just determined to be like, okay, that was my last experience. I'm really proud of myself. I don't want to be in that situation anymore, but no, that wasn't the case. And I have to say as well, I've never been harassed by a female coworker. That was a first time for me. So I didn't know how to deal with that. And this particular female coworker is, you know, um, she has a past that reflects issues with mental health and like family background things just from what she's told me and like her general behavior you know but wow yeah so that's what we're going to be talking about but before we get into that i have a couple other things so i was thinking about what segments i want to add to this channel to this show and i realized i was like great i love local news I think I mentioned in the previous episode how my mom always made my brother and my sister and I watch the evening news and the morning news before school. And so I just got into the habit of watching like really intense news and I was into 2020 as a preteen teenager and throughout my early 20s until you know you get the formula of like the hype media story and how that's just overplayed and over investigated. You can't see my fingers, over investigated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so my thoughts about 2020 naturally change. Um, but yeah, so I want to just pick random states and find local news stories that seem interesting. And for this, for today's episode, I chose Alabama because I thought, well, it'll be, it'll be lighthearted, you know, um, I'll find something really simple like local cat becomes town hero or high school prank goes terribly wrong or some local sex scandal with a politician and a beautician, I don't know. I was just hoping for something light, but then I discovered that Alabama is still withholding societal evolution by finding every way possible to legally restrict free will in their state. And you know, you would think that <laughs> a state that is struggling to provide for its schools, and its people and its infrastructures you would honestly think they'd be smarter about their economy instead of you know ostracizing people and forcing people out and not bringing any business to their state because there's not going to be too many people who are like yeah yeah that's where i've always wanted to move my company to alabama like oh gosh it's just disappointing and I have to be honest and say that I've never had any desire to go to Alabama. One, of course, slavery in the South. The South just has a different kind of juju. And I'm very sensitive to energy. And 
I don't want to feel everything associated with that environment. But yeah, I still think it's, well, yeah, uh, aside from slavery, general racism, and the lack of funding in their education system, but there's all these people getting wealthy off of meat production. Uh, there's just a lot of things with the Alabama that need to be updated. And of course, um, abortion rights, you know, I, it's just ridiculous. I want this state to be known for something good. And yeah, I mean, I personally don't like follow football, but you know, I know they're known for football. I grew up in West Virginia, so I know it's important to uh, country folks. <laughs> but yeah, so I was really just disappointed. But I learned that they are restricting gender reassignment therapy treatment for trans youth, and that has gone into law. And I have to be honest, I really dipped out of the news circuit. I just needed that time for my own mental health. So this is also me slowly diving back in. But what I learned is that the Southern Poverty Law Center and Alabama's ACLU have withdrawn their lawsuits against Senate Bill 184. So yeah, Alabama is a true disappointment for sure. I don't think it'll last you know, I don't think it'll last. I think things will turn around. Um, they're trying to make it punishable up to 10 years for doctors who provide treatment to trans youth. It's just like mm, the trans community undertakes a huge spiritual journey to be who they are. And that journey is physical and of course it's psychological. And to break out of the societal construct of gender is an immense journey to take. And a lot of us are blessed to not have to have a moment where you wake up and you know you're not in the right body and you don't know how to fix that because your society has barriers on barriers from the most basic things to putting your name somewhere and checking off a box, to going into a store and going into the men's section or the women's section. It's this constant reminder that you're one or the other. And how do you wake up and the courage you need to have to take those steps to become who you are. It's an amazing journey and that is the free will of the human soul when Alabama is trying to spiritually, mentally, and physically constrict that for the trans community. Um, to anybody that is, I just don't know why people still live there. <laughs> I just don't get it. But I think spiritually what we need to think about with this story is that We are energetic beings and we are so much more than our human bodies. We are matter and we are consciousness at the end of the day. And the society needs to evolve their basic perception of the human identity and empower yourselves to believe that you're something much more and you have the free will to be who you are and the thing in this matrix, in this world, is that that's constantly going to be challenged and it fucking sucks, you know? I have so many days where I just wanna write a poem and go in the middle of the street and rant about the challenges of being a black woman. Now I have to work through all of these barriers because of just that one aspect of my identity, you know? I'm probably gonna go into some story about that I won't rant <laughs> or cry or write a poem, but I do have some things to say about it. But yeah, the yeah, I just think that we as a collective need to 
you know, see ourselves as these limitless beings and evolve this social <laughs> dominance and restrictions we place upon others' bodies and their minds, essentially. But yeah, anyways, going into something lighter, what's something that's so absolutely unnecessary and a waste in our economy that would be an umbrella without a push button i recently lost a really good umbrella of mine that i had i think for like almost four years it was a good umbrella and it got me through some really tough days and i had to buy a new umbrella and i think i should have learned my lesson about buying the cheaper option by now but I just assumed that all umbrellas would come with the push button feature, but this umbrella didn't and I have to like manually like crank it up, but I just think that's the biggest economical waste because I believe the push button umbrellas came out in the in like the early 2000s, if not as sooner, who knows? I could be wrong. I haven't formally looked this up. I'm just basing it off of my observations as a child, but I do believe that it's been around for a while. So if there's any fucking umbrella on market, on the market that doesn't have the push button, you should absolutely fix that. Because I will, I will yelp, I will write reviews, I will call you out. No, I, I won't do all those things, but I, I just don't think it's, it's not okay. It's not okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> Next, what's a song for 75 degree weather and a bike ride? That would be Cognac by Monster Rally and Jay Stone. And yes, I have personally biked to that song, so I can attest to that being a good song for a 75 degree weather bike ride. Um, what's something that I recently accepted? Um, so in my previous job, I worked in corporate academia. I had a nice salary. I was climbing up the position ladder. You know, I was building a good reputation for myself but my mental health and my physical health was deteriorating and I had to make change in my life and I had to finally follow my creative endeavors and do that fully and fully commit to them. You know, I learned what it's like to have all of the health insurance, salary, you know, a place to live, all of those basic comforts, but that not fulfill you and to know that feeling really pushes you to take that risk and follow your creative endeavors. But, um, you know, when I did that, I think I was being delusional in the sense that I thought it would be, it would go a bit smoother, you know? It was a complete wreck for like the first few months and I ended up like having to live in my car for almost 10 months. It was a huge spiritual experience for me and it changed me forever. And it was hard at first to go back to a entry level customer service job. It was hard to accept that no, I couldn't handle actually being in an office, it would almost be traumatic for me. Um, there's just so many aspects that you have to deal with on a general level and when you are in a corporate office setting, but if you add your race to that, your hair, <laughs> you, you, there's all these other just factors that you have to be aware of and it's exhausting. And not only did I want to follow my artistic career, but I needed something that didn't make me think too hard or put all the social pressure on me or put me in 
unhealthy environments. You know, I just wanted a work environment that was healthy and I was very blessed to get a job at New Seasons because no, it's not the perfect place to work, but there's so many great benefits and I retain a lot of my creative energy. A lot of that energy that in my previous job I was constantly giving to a system that was not giving back to me and it was depleting me in a sense. But yeah, that happens at new seasons physically just out of, you know, cashiering is kind of exhausting. I don't know, I see almost 120, at least 120 different customers on a basic day. And on our busy days, it's almost 200 customers that I scan and bag all the groceries for. <laughs> and you know, I've had some customers be like, oh, you look a little tired. And I'll be like, yeah, I'm pretty tired. I was like, this can be exhausting. And you know, they'll be like, oh, really? And I'll be like, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm like, in no way is it, you know, I don't know, it's just, it's exhausting sometimes. I almost lost my train of thought. I think I did lose my train of thought. But I also might be rambling, but, oh yeah. Okay, so that job just gave me the opportunity to follow my artistic endeavors and have a job that didn't really stress me out that much. Yeah, you have to deal with some customers pissing you off or creeping you out or, you know, sometimes you get into small little coworker tiffs, but nothing super serious, nothing that's really going to make me want to have, you know, three shots of whiskey, two joints, and yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it could be like that sometimes, but I've reached this place of acceptance of not putting pressure on myself or feeling bad about where I'm at in my life right now. And the fact that I haven't really produced an income for my creative endeavors and I've made these huge, huge risks and that payoff isn't quite manifesting materially yet, but Mm. Spiritually, I think it's, I think it's changed me in the best way possible. I mean, I am like the healthiest I've ever been. You know, my social life has changed a lot, but that's only because I know that I am prone to procrastination and being lethargic as well. And that's not an insult, you know, it's just, it's just one of my weaknesses and I hate to admit that. So I know that when it comes to my projects and my endeavors, I kind of have to go hard now because I don't know what I'm gonna be like two more years from now or mentally, I don't think I could be that patient and, and have minimum wage. I don't, I don't think that's gonna work for me. So. Yeah, I'd rather just go hard now and focus on my health, my flexibility, you know, physically staying in shape. I'm ranting a lot, but I'm just basically saying that, <laughs> I'm basically saying that I'm healthier, I'm a lot happier, my mental health is a lot better. You know, I've never, I never would have thought like, making this journey and taking these steps would change me that way, but it has. And I think taking this new path with podcasting and YouTube is gonna just to expand my artistry even more. And I'm excited to see where that takes me. And I'm embracing where I'm at now because one, I work at a wellness grocery store with really great organic produce and I have a 20 off 20% 20 off discount and we have access to items that have just expired and most expired food are only like legally expired you know they just have to have some legal date to really say don't do this by this day but there's a lot of food items that 
hold well after their expiration dates and we get access to all that stuff for free. Also even like supplements and things like that, it's, it's kind of amazing and it's helped me elevate my own health in the process. You know, so there are those days where I want to quit or cuss out a customer, but then I think about inflation and the food benefits I have right now and how as an artist I am better off here for just a little bit longer and it'll pay off eventually. But yeah, so I've reached acceptance about that. And I think as an artist in general to reach acceptance about, let's say you're upset about a lack of opportunity. Well, maybe that lack of opportunity is you not creating those opportunities. You have to sort of build your own space in a field and grow in that space. And then from there, I think the universe responds and helps you expand that space. And that's what I'm learning to accept. You know, a lack of opportunity is just extra time to build your skills, to build your confidence, to just elevate yourself so that you can energetically meet those opportunities that you're manifesting for yourself. And if it's a lack of finances and security, like, yes, that sucks, but you know, I think spiritually we have that time so we develop a trust in the universe that our needs will always be met. And if they aren't met, there's a reason for it and we just have to trust that everything is truly working out in our favor. So building that sense of spiritual security within ourselves and that sense of trust that you know, you're on the right path. That's, that's the spiritual wealth that we all have the ability to gain access to. And I think that's a blessing of following an artistic path is that you get a chance to really surrender and just trust and, you know, keep working towards your goals because that's all you have control over at the end of the day. But yeah. Mm. So thirsty tonight, goodness. Um, but let's talk about escalated conflict now because, yeah, yesterday was super fascinating. Like I was like, I got home and usually on my Fridays when I get home, uh, I'll have to like smoke and have some tea or I have to get straight into a bath to help myself relax and like, get out of work mo mode, but often I'm like too tired and in a daze. It's just a weird energy when I get off work on my Fridays. But sometimes I'll also journal, but I couldn't journal about this situation with my coworker. Cause I just, I did not see it coming. But I think the universe was delivering me an opportunity to follow through with that conflict that I was avoiding because there were so many instances of this coworker harassing me where I was like, man, like I, I could cuss her out, you know, but like I was just, I was just too afraid to go there and have to put myself through another situation where I'm talking to HR or my work environment's changed and I don't know if a coworker is going to try to retaliate because I've spoken up for myself. There's, there was just a lot of things that I was trying to avoid in that process. These lights are driving me crazy. Um, so yeah, but within the first hour of my shift, this coworker comes through my line and this person has not come through my line in a while. So I was surprised that she did it <laughs> and she just had like um, a cold bottle of water. And so I'm so used to dealing with like creepy customers, like men, some really weird men that I have like this whole switch that I do where I just go into like autopilot, be calm, 
make it fast, don't say much, and don't make too much eye contact. Like that's my whole system. And I know like at my job they always say like, come get us, you know? Let us know if you feel uncomfortable, but sometimes we're in the middle of a huge rush and I have a line of like seven people and I'm afraid to make a scene or I'm afraid to make the kids in line uncomfortable. So I, I don't say anything and I just, yeah, I just have my whole little five step thing I do and I, <laughs> I get through it. And so that was my mindset when she came through my line. And my supervisor, she was just grabbing hand cards from underneath the end of my register. Um, and so I was like, oh, it just felt like a normal situation. But then she takes the cards and she comes to the other end of my register. And, you know, I take Keisha's, oh, shit. <laughs> Man, I wasn't gonna say a name, but I guess it really doesn't matter. I take her water, <laughs> I take her water bottle and I scan it. And then um, I wasn't making any eye contact with her. So I just see her her hand jut out and she has her employee ID card for her discount and her hand shaking. And so my intuition, of course, was just like, oh, what the fuck is this? And then she starts saying how she really respects me as a woman and a person, which was nice to hear, but the complexities of our situation, it just, it was really weird, of course. And my supervisor is just there listening. And I just like knew to stay calm. And I like looked her in the eyes as she was saying all this to me. And she goes on telling me how she's offended that I don't acknowledge her or treat her like a person. And, um, yeah, she kind of just says how bad it makes, how bad it makes her, how it makes her feel. And she doesn't understand why. And I was just, I was like, okay, okay, I'm going to let her finish and then I'll, then I'm just going to say it. <laughs> I'm going to say it. And yay, good thing my boss is here. And so I was like, first, thank you for expressing your feelings. I, And then I told her that me not acknowledging her is just me protecting my energy. And I didn't think I had to explain myself to somebody who sexually harassed me. And I go on to tell her, like, you know, a couple incidents and... a few other things and um, <laughs> it just kind of blew my mind but she basically acted like she, she literally said like oh that's that's why you weren't talking to me and there were other females there are other females in the store and um, one who's left to have had their own situations with this coworker. So it's not just me, it's like a pattern that I've seen her do with other females and I just happen to be one of them, you know? And the collective knowing of like, okay, I'm not crazy and it's happened to other females. You know, sadly we've all bonded over that because uh, when she, when this coworker develops a crush on you, she goes, really, really hard, and it, it escalates to obsession, and another example of a person that um, she developed such an obsession with, you know, she got violent, <laughs> kind of yelled in the street, and you know, vandalize some property. So, yeah. I mean, but I wasn't afraid in that moment that she would do anything. I was mostly just stunned that there was that lack of awareness and connection about her behaviors and the consequences of that behavior. And my supervisor stood there the whole time and for some reason, because I'm too polite and kind, I just, 
I honestly just allowed, I think I shook her hand. I think, you know, I told her that I was like, I don't really see myself like working to develop a friendship with you, but you know, I was like, maybe I can get to a place one day where I can say hi to you and it doesn't make me uncomfortable. And my coworker was like, yeah, yeah. And she was like, you know, I've been working on my boundaries and you know, that's something I'm getting better at. And just to let you know, she was crying and she was saying all this to me. It was just fucking crazy and stunning, you know? I didn't, I just didn't see it coming, but I'm grateful it happened because it was at least a wake up call to see how kindness can, the kindness and politeness that society needs to be maintained to maintain cooperativeness cooperativeness in society um how it's impacted and sometimes it overrides my own need to protect myself and it's truly i was just trying to avoid any sort of formal employee conflict situations i just did not I didn't want to be here for it, but there I was avoiding conflict, literally. Mm. But yeah, I wrote down um, the good things about that situation. You know, I think I handled myself well. I think I spoke up for myself. Um, I think in a way, it was kind of healing because I don't think I'd ever be able to have that moment of acknowledgement of behavior from a male coworker who sexually harassed me. You know, I don't think that they would be able to set aside their pride or maturity to the point where they could actually admit that they did something wrong and be sorry for it. Cause that's, that's, that wasn't the case in my previous experience. And I think the universe knew that I would never get it from a man. <laughs> and so I had an opportunity to have that type of closure. And of course I would have to get it from a woman. So it, it was a really fascinating situation, but I did make a couple of mistakes, you know, um, even though I've done this in, in my previous job where I had to file um, harassment claims, I did not document in this situation. I didn't report to HR when things were happening. I didn't tell her to stop outright. You know, I think having that moment of like, just shut the fuck up and don't say this shit to me. I should have fucking said that. I should have just stopped <laughs> trying to be so nice and understanding and just told her to shut the fuck up, you know? And of course, I let my kindness complex override my security. Um, it's made me think about my level of kindness and shout out to Karina Lude. Um, she's a YouTuber and her channel is really informative. And she was recently talking about her issues with being kind and polite and how it's impacted her in a negative way. And it's really made me think about how much I fear my own mean side. And I think we as society aren't allowed to access our mean sides. You know, I think when we're growing up, if we're angry, we're told that anger is not appropriate. Anger means you're not in control of your emotions. You're not repressing your emotions. <laughs> I think that's really what it is at the end of the day. But I think that just triples into, okay, now you're an adult and here's all these expectations. Here's the amount of money you need to make to survive. And here's the workplace that you'll go into to meet those survival needs. And you will do what you need to do to maintain that source of income. So just all of these things that constantly remind us that anger is not acceptable, healthy, or productive. But I think people need to find, like people need to lose control and experience coming back down from it. 
to find true like balance, you know? Like you can't be afraid of what that's like, but so often people don't really get to explore that because, you know, society doesn't allow it. But I think energetically, it's kind of necessary in a way. So, mm, I've actually thought about things I can do to be a mean person for like seven days. And yeah, I mean, I didn't really have a lot of ideas. I could leave piss on a public bathroom seat. I could leave an abandoned buggy filled with cold groceries on a hot day. Um, let's see. Uh, you know, it's hard to think of any ideas that won't get me arrested or cause someone to actually want to retaliate and, like, beat the shit out of me. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I think another approach is testing your boundaries of speaking your truth even when it might offend somebody. And embracing those consequences socially. I think that's what it is at the end of the day. It's like, okay, you know, I'm going to say how I feel in this situation. I don't, I do care about the social consequences, but I think it's better if I am a part of that movement where people are speaking up and being honest about how they feel and you know, maybe that social politeness, you know, it'll just be intrinsic. Like, yes, I'll hold this door for you, or yeah, I'll let you come into this lane. You know, I, I think those things are going to be natural on their own, but there's still room for people to express truth. And Maybe it won't be so passive and just through social media. Who knows? I don't know. But I think it's interesting. And I hope people think about their experiences with following through with conflict and what that response was like in childhood and what levels of conflict resolution were you aware of in your family and what was missing. and. How have you transferred those behaviors in your lives? Because I've certainly realized I'm susceptible to following familial patterns when it comes to handling conflict, forgiving people, and reaching a sp space of peace with someone else in a conflict situation. It's fascinating. <laughs> but yeah, I hope everybody thinks about it. Anyways, this is another really interesting episode of Sleepy Aliens Perspective. Thank you for tuning in, and thank you for listening to me ramble. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.